by engaging your content, you're focused on educating your audience, your ICP, and then also building that trust and brand awareness with them so that then rather than focusing on gating and collecting leads, you're educating and building that brand awareness with them over time. I'm waiting for that side of your audience that isn't ready to purchase to come and eventually submit a demo request and when they are ready with the full knowledge about everything they need to know about your product because you, they've seen all your, your marketing beforehand, they've been able to access it. In that sense, you've created demand within that person. And when someone comes and registers for a demo, we know that they close much quicker than an outbound lead or a lead from like a gated piece of content. And that's because they already know who you are. They've researched and found out the problems that you solve. They come with intent and with a purchasing mindset. And that, you know, increases everything along the lines of, from your ACB to reduces that sales cycle and means that they come armed with the decision makers that you need uh, on the call as well. And that to me is truly generating demand. Every SaaS company plays for high stakes, but what does it take to dominate the market right now? Welcome to Paris Talks Marketing the podcast where we dive deep into the latest trends and strategies in SaaS marketing that are really working today. I'm your host, Paris, and our guests are SaaS CMOs, founders, and specialists, and we discuss one trendy topic in the industry per episode. Ready to unlock the true power of marketing strategy? In this theme, we'll explore the world of cutting-edge marketing strategies and tactics, that are shaking up the SaaS industry. We'll share insights on testing new tactics and uncover the latest developments from digital landscape giants like Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'll also explore how AI is revolutionizing the digital landscape and transforming marketing tactics. So grab your headphones and get ready for a marketing strategy masterclass with Paris Talks Marketing. Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Paris Talks Marketing. Today, my guest is Liam Bartholomew. Liam is the VP of marketing at Cognizm, and he's been there for the last four and a half years, helping to grow the marketing team from four to now over 40 people. Liam is passionate about demand generation and shaking up B2B marketing to move it away from traditional lean gen, demonstrating how we can all do more fun, advanced, and buyer-centric marketing. Welcome to the show, Liam. Thanks, Paris. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. One thing that jumps out immediately from your bio is growing a marketing team from four to 40 people in just a few years. Can you walk me through that journey a little bit? Who were the first four people and how did you manage that growth? Yes. The first four people were myself and I was campaign marketing manager at that point. We had a content marketer, Alice, who heads up the team. She's kind of a weird luxury to have at the time, but kind of a random hire was a video marketing executive, which actually turned out to be so great and useful. And I think also how it's kind of shaped the type of marketing we do and, and being better at using video at that time as well. That was great. And then really we sort of expanded with need after then. So getting a performance marketer in and then also a product marketer before starting to like grow each of those respective teams and then building out customer marketing function as well. It's kind of taken lots of different shapes since then. And we went through a crazy period of growth, really, where I'd say 2019 to 2020, we probably got the team to roughly about 10 people. And then by the time it was like 2021, we were more like close to about 2020. But in 2022 is when we had a real space of growth. Cognizant just got its Series C and we basically doubled headcount that year. So we went from 20 to about 40 then, and then pretty much held sort of roughly stable since then. So it's been crazy. I think we started off with like a real need for keeping up with the growth and creating demand and generating new business for Cognizant, which meant that the team was, you know, largely demand gen and performance marketers and content. And then as we've grown, we started to focus on other key functions that I think have become increasingly more and more important to us, like product marketing and, and, and customer marketing as well. Now, I imagine that those years, 2020, 2019, 2021, these were COVID years and you all are providing employee experience platform. Am I correct? Sorry, sales intelligence and B2B platform. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, I got that. I was a little bit off of that. 
it played into our hands in COVID in the same way, right? So obviously companies during COVID, like all of everyone's event budget got pulled and then they're looking for ways to spend that money. And the first place a lot of people were looking and like a lot of while people attend trade shows and like all these events to get data, so people turn to companies like Cognizum or our competitors like Apollo and Zoom and Facebook to get that data then. So yeah, the pandemic years actually turned out to be really busy for us. Yeah, I'm actually checking out the, the G2 grid that you all are in. I'm going to pull this up on the screen. It's one of the most crowded that I've ever seen here. Yeah. So yeah. it's the category of sales intelligence and Zoom Info is in here, Apollo, but here you are at Cognizum. Like really, I think in a pretty rare stratosphere, I would say in this grid, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is here. And I'm, I'm imagining, gosh, I mean, it's just so, so crowded. Now you all have taken a unique position also geographically to focus more outside of the US. Is that correct? Yeah, we've gr we're grown into US. We have like a Boston sales office, but I mean, really we're very much a UK first company. So that's where we, we were founded and where I'd say larger operations are in the UK, but we're trying to expand out into the US at the moment. But the majority of our competitors like Apollo and Zoom Info and Seamless and Lucia, who I can all see on there as well, are all US-based. And outside of the geographic differentiation, what else about Cognizum really sets you apart from the other players in this category? What do you all do better than anyone else? I'd say the, the thing that we've focused on specifically has been data quality. And so we're, we really focused on the, the number one asset being our big selling point. So we haven't really gone down the route of having all the bells and whistles and lots of additional features and different offering systems for different personas and stuff. But what we do have focused on really is having the most accurate data possible and ac having accuracy even at the uh, expense of coverage at times, but like accuracy being number one. And we focus this by like creating a whole new class of data and our diamond data, which is human verified data. So we actually make sure we, we actually call up and verify that data ourselves. Um, and that's where we really put ourselves as a differentiator. Is that more challenging in EMEA where you've got a GDPR? I mean, I, th I think that it, it's clear that GDPR can make it difficult for companies to take data, let's say that they're getting from Cognizum or other tools and immediately launch, let's say outbound marketing campaigns to those folks. How do you deal with GDPR for your customers? Yeah, I think that the main thing is that there's different rules in different countries within Europe. So quite often, you know, the, the data is able to be processed and, and used, but maybe not. There'll be different rules on then how you action it. I suppose as we know, like the DAC region has like a double opt-in on email and there's lots of other countries that still have like a single opt-in. So you'd still need to get that consent, but then you can use the data in other ways, for example, we're big advocates of pushing cold calling and, and its value still, even in the DAC region, make cold calls, even if you're not using uh, email without double opt-in consent. There's other ways you can use the data, if, even if it's not for pure outbound motions, right? It's to be able to enrich existing data that you've got where you have ex existing opt-ins to like improve your own campaigns, maybe by further segmentation. And also being able to use the data to create other audiences and paid platforms, for example, so being able to use data from Cognizum to create matched audiences in LinkedIn and Facebook where those platforms might not have the necessary data to create those audiences themselves. So there's lots of different ways you can do it. I mean, if you limit yourself maybe to email, which I think is probably the most regulated of, of the channels, then yeah, you might struggle, I suppose, to make use in every country in Europe, but it's, there's lots of different ways to make use of the data. And we would encourage that as well, rather than just flooding one channel and like do it, running a spray and pray approach with email. So if anything, those legislations actually can just play into you doing better marketing. Yeah. Now you all are clearly champions of outbound marketing, outbound sales, but I'm looking at the resources section of your website, which is very, very rich, the content hub. You've got tons of blog posts, reports, checklists and templates, a demand gen playbook course, podcasts, newsletters, webinars, is almost every type here. Can you talk to me about how you're balancing, probably using your own tool, Cognizum, 
to do outbound marketing versus all this inbound marketing and content marketing that I'm seeing here on the website? Yeah. So, and I think this is kind of like a selling point for how we would use Cognizant or try and then run our marketing is that we have a depth of data to be able to do outbound to. And so we don't have to run a huge like lead generation program from the marketing team to fuel the SDRs with leads because they can get those leads from Cognizant. And as we would say, if we like gated any of these content assets and sent those and then took those download submissions and sent them over to SDR. So it's actually the same level of intent to purchase Cognizant as there is if you uh, get that contact information from Cognizant itself. But the intent was to read the content. It wasn't actually to purchase the product. So we take that liberty and we say that the SDRs are fine. They have Cognizant data to do their research and their outreach. And what we can do then is create huge um, amounts of ungated content assets that we then have on the website and available to access here and that we push out on lots of different paid media platforms to create demand and awareness with our ICP. The idea is to create just really valuable content that people come back to, to get more information from and almost that we become like hooked in their sort of like access of information and, and like research and entertainment if we can as well. So that's a whole strategy really about being everywhere all the time, all at once, and meeting all of our ICP where they are. Yeah. So just to be clear here, you're not gating any of these premium content assets. You're letting everyone access everything on demand without making them fill out a form. And the reason for that is, is because you're saying that your SDR teams are going to be able to get that data anyway, and that the intent is the same anyway, right? If I have an intent to watch a webinar, then after that, my lead score is going to be just the same as if I had filled out a form to get that same webinar access. Is that right? Right, exactly. Well, then why gate it if you already know? What actually happens when you ungate the content as well is that the consumption of it goes up. So you naturally restrict a ton of consumption as soon as you gate something. Because like me, if I see a form, I just normally press back. Like I don't fill out the form ready for the content unless it's something I really, really want. And then I still might even just put incorrect details in because I don't necessarily want to be cold called or, or like followed up on in that sense. But if you ungate it, then what happens is consumption goes up, people watch everything. And then when you do cold call and then the SDR lands that number and they speak to that prospect, they know exactly who you are because they've been engaging with all of the content as well. And it makes that conversation go that much easier. Yeah. And, and it's also powerful for paid remarketing campaigns, because then if, if you ungate all your content and you have enough traffic that's get, getting to that content, you can create a large enough remarketing audiences that you wouldn't be able to do that if you were gating the content because you wouldn't have any audiences. Exactly. And the remarketing audiences, it's, it's a much more engaged in general, right? Because it's not like remarketing off them coming to a landing page where they'd have to fill out a form either. It's normally remarketing content that they've engaged with themselves. So Now, let me play devil's advocate for a minute here because this is a, maybe a doomsday uh, AI scenario. But these large language models now are getting trained on everything that's publicly available online. And that's including all of your premium content that you've ungated. So all the white papers, the eBooks, the webinars, and the, the transcripts of those webinars. So if we maybe fast forward a, a year or so out from now, when a lot of the people who are now searching are going to be chatting in a chat experience with tools like Gemini and ChatGPT. And if you are the, the best provider of the answer to someone's question, but they're not searching, so that, that's not going to drive a, a click or traffic to your branded website, but rather your answer is going to be provided through an AI chatbot without attribution to your brand. Would that make you rethink the argument on gating content? Because if, in that kind of scenario, a lot of the people that you will be benefiting are not going to even know that you were the brand that, that gave them the, the good advice or the answer. And then they might go down someone else's conversion funnel on the basis of that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but I think going on like chat GPT and asking it a question and getting an answer that I want to get the answer from or getting the content that I need is one part of why content marketing works because it provides value. But the other part that it does is it builds trust. 
and promotes your brand. So in those moments, I think when you go through an AI like that, yeah, we would have lost any attribution to that and any real like recognition that came from our own original content. But the purpose of creating the content in the first place would be for when people do come through to like Cognizant website that they can see that, that we have that. A lot of companies are over-indexed on written content and that's been the case for a long time. And they're also over-indexed to like putting all that content on their website. And that actually you need to be in multiple channels and in multiple formats. If you're putting out loads of content in video and like on social, so on like LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, you're running podcasts like this as well and putting them out on Spotify, then you're going to be like maximizing your chances of your content reaching other people in different formats that these large language models won't be picking up for necessary yet. But let's also assume that they've worked something and that stuff up in the future. But I think the principles of marketing stay the same, even when we, we face the, the different, like the challenges that like the new technology would bring. That would be my take on it rather than it being like a doomsday where the thing is to stop doing content or gate it so that the AI doesn't get hold of it. Yeah. Yeah. Then you would have more control over your conversion funnel, but then you would still lack the distribution because if you gate everything. You're limiting so much your reach and, and the distribution wouldn't be there. So I think it's an interesting, thought-provoking future world. But even if people start to eventually shift their habits from search to uh, chat, I think that the, the chat experience will eventually start to figure out a way how to monetize, not only through subscriptions, which is like it is today, but through some f form of ad monetized model, which still the incentive for people to still create and publish content needs to be there. You know, otherwise, large language models will just shrivel up because they won't have any, any new content to gobble up and to learn on. Yeah, they'll have no input for it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I don't suppose that's always a thing with gated content. Maybe it would get to a world as well where in that scenario where you have ungated content and then your most valuable pieces you somehow keep behind a wall to bring people in. I think the difference with the state of play at the moment is most content's gated and most of it's not that valuable. I think there's obviously room for super valuable pieces to be gated. We know there's like actual media publications where it's gated and charged and that's because people aren't willing to pay to see that content. But I think realistically in like a B2B marketing world, we have to be very honest about whether what you've got is so valuable that it, it should be gated. I think if you put a huge amount of effort into an original piece of research, then maybe, but most of the time, I think it's better around gated. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And generally, I'm in that camp to remove all the gates, except the, the one form that has to be there, which is your book of demo form. I mean, ultimately, that's got to be there. Yeah. Unless, I guess, a live chat would be the alternative, but I think many people are not really using these too much. But I think these are going to be remade as well with AI because I think that the, the ChatGPT experience is going to start to be supplanted into websites and you'll be able to chat with websites that are trained on your company's data and trained like a real sales agent that can have a conversation and even reply with clarifying questions and engage in a real conversation instead of basically trying to shortcut you right to book a demo or something like that through conversation tree logic or something. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. I think that all the chatbots they built are decision trees that's going to change. Max. They're, they're, they're gone. Yeah, I mean, th yeah. those are going to be gone soon. Uh, I think it's easy enough now to just build a GPT trained with like sales call transcripts, discovery calls, your YouTube video transcripts. And any other product information, pricing, all of your company data so that that bot can pretty much answer any question. It can be sales, it can be customer support, it can be everything in one, actually. But what needs to change is actually the behavior of people when they come to websites. Because now, when I come to a website, my, I'm trained to think about, all right, I want to find the homepage and orient myself. And then I'm going to look at the navigation and figure out where I need to go. But it's a navigational mindset as opposed to a conversational mindset. And maybe that will change. I mean, if we start to come to websites and expect the conversation and look for the AI agent or the assistant or whoever, it would be a better experience if it works well, if I could just say to, to the Cognizant bot, look, I've got a list size of 15,000 and they're mostly in healthcare. 
and I haven't reached out in about two years. Do you think it's even worth trying to re-engage these people? And if so, how can I re-engage people that are two years stale? And that bot could say, no, actually, here's a strategy for you. You start segmenting. And then after you segment, you test with A-B testing on messaging and blah, blah, blah. That would be really cool. I mean, that would be something that an SDR could probably go through in a call. And in some ways, the bot becomes the SDR, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. The Paris Talks Marketing Show is affiliated with Hop Online, a performance marketing agency focused on high-growth SaaS and other recurring revenue-based companies. If you like the flow of this conversation, you may want to consider jumping on a discovery call with someone at Hop Online. A discovery call is similar to my podcast interviews in a lot of ways. We'll get to know your business goals, competitive landscape, and marketing needs. And you'll almost certainly come away with some new ideas for how to accelerate your customer and revenue growth. If you're interested, go to hop.online, that's hop, H-O-P, dot online, and book a discovery call with one of our strategists today. Now, back to the episode. But I really digress there. I want to get back on track here. There's something that you've mentioned in the pre-show about demand gen strategy versus lead gen strategy. That's come up on the show before also. How do you see the distinction between demand generation and lead generation and which one are you betting more on? Yeah, I mean, I think that really relates to what we were just talking about, really. And that is that by engaging your content, you're focused on educating your audience, your ICP, and then also building that trust and brand awareness with them. So that then rather than focusing on gating and collecting leads, you're educating and building that brand awareness with them over time. I'm waiting for that side of your audience that isn't ready to purchase to come and eventually submit a demo request when they are ready with the full knowledge about everything they need to know about your product because you, they've seen all your, your marketing beforehand, they've been able to access it. In that sense, you've created demand within that person. And when someone comes and registers for a demo, we know that they close much quicker than an outbound lead or a lead from a gated piece of content. And that's because they already know who you are. They've researched and found out the problems that you solve. They come with intent and with a purchasing mindset. And that, you know, increases everything along the lines of, from your ACB to reduces that sales cycle and means that they come armed with the decision makers that you need uh, on the call as well. And that to me is truly generating demand. And what we see often in lead gen is we talk about of oh, the people have demand generation titles and they're, they're running lead gen, but lead gen is really just about collecting contact data as quickly as you can via content that you put out and gate and then following up on those leads by pushing them too quickly into a, a sales funnel and sales motion. So you, you collect that lead and then you might put them through a sequence of emails um, to determine to warm them up, assuming that I suppose that anyone can be turned to a purchasing decision after X number of emails and then maybe call them as well and cold call them of try and get them into a meeting to force them through the sales cycle. And, and obviously people will take meetings more likely after downloading some content and filling out a form for it that they may be aware of you. But by the time they're actually on that meeting to purchase, they actually have no more intent to purchase a product than they did previously because that's not what they were looking to do. And they probably will still have a ton of questions because they've not been able to, to learn or educate themselves on your product and services easily because the content hasn't been uh, readily available. So to me, that's the difference between lead gen and demand gen. And I think the reason why demand gen is for me, the future and better is because it's more biocentric. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to learn on our own time, understand, engage with brands and be able to, you know, when we're ready to speak to them, come forward and be able to get all of the answers that we need additionally as opposed to being pushed into something that we're not ready to do, which quite often the reason why we're not ready to do, especially in a B2B sense, is we just aren't able to in those moments. We don't have the need or budget or authority to be able to make those decisions at the point in time. So in a way, it's putting inbound before outbound, actually. It's investing in inbound so that you can set up your outbound motions to be successful. Because if you reach out cold to an audience that has never even heard of Cognizant at all, 
the success rate is going to be very low. Whether you cold call or you do really aggressive sequences on email or LinkedIn, if they haven't heard of you at all, the chances are pretty low. But creating that awareness through inbound by putting out all this great content, entirely yeah. ungating it, it, that, and so that you, you have the opportunity to get a lot of traffic or organically to it. These people are not ready to buy, but they become aware of your brand. And then later, when they go into an outbound sequence, when you determine that they're ready for that, they're going to have the awareness. And so they're going to be even more likely to open the email, read the email, maybe click through a link that's in that email. Because then they might not even remember where they've heard it, but it's going to be even subconsciously kind of uh, lodged in their brains that this is something kind of familiar. This is not entirely cold. So inbound to set up outbound in a way. Yeah. And like even I think within the demand generation strategy, outbound can be used as either a demand capture or a demand creation tactic itself. It's a channel, right? So a way of reaching the market. So cold-calling someone after you've created demand in that individual through other marketing efforts, and they might be able to capture that demand easily. At that point, they catch them at the exact right time. Maybe they've interacted with a ton of your assets and they're hyper-engaged with Cognizant, and then they go turn up to an event that you're at, and then you can capture the demand then, or maybe you call them just at the right time that they're looking on your website, and then you capture the demand there. That's how you could tee up that outbound side, but you could also switch outbound itself to be a uh, demand gen motion in the fair sense that, you know, SDRs go on the phone and they call often with one thing in mind. And that's often how it's incentivized to book a meeting, which means that the thing they're forced to do by incentive is to get someone and actually interested in what someone's got to say or who they are, they're just interested in the end result of getting them in that meeting. Whereas if you took it from a create demand approach, you might get someone on the phone and you can actually learn something interesting about them, build a relationship, realize that maybe this isn't the, the right time for them, but that's fine because you can create that relationship, which is in them creating demand, share content, keep that door open, and then come back and book a meeting at the right time. But again, it takes a different way of incentivizing SDRs to how they're often incentivized, which is on meetings, but. Yeah. Ultimately, every person will respond to the incentives, right? So if you want them to try to book a meeting in that first call, then that's what the incentive is. But if you want them to nurture that a little bit more, then you can set things up differently. You mentioned demand capture. I, I see that as the other side of the coin to demand generation is demand fulfillment or demand capture. What are you all doing at Cognizant to capture the high intent traffic that's there, people that are searching for sales engagement tool for whatever. Tell me a little bit about the demand capture, bottom of funnel acquisition marketing. Oh uh, yeah. So we, we run a big Google ads program. So spend a lot on Google ads. The bulk of all of the budget goes actually on a lot of competitor campaigns. One thing for us is where market is super competitive and we have lots of competitors. So we can bid on such terms, which includes obviously people looking for our competitors, looking for comparisons with us and our competitors. Sometimes what we do is like crash a party where they're looking for comparisons between the other two competitors. So maybe like Lucia versus Zoom Info and, and bidding on, on the, and those uh, search terms as well to, to capture it there. Um, and then we run a very similar strategy, I suppose, to what we're running then on Google Ads, which is about competitors, high intent brand. We do this, a similar thing for SEO, which we call money keyword strategy, where we focus on building out, again, versus pages, alternative pages, crush the party pages uh, around all of our competitors, and then working on specific money keywords, which is, you know, maybe buy B2B lists, buy B2B data, and keeping all of the SEO that we do specifically focused on high intent regardless and with high conversion possibility regardless necessarily of the keyword volume and traffic whereas before we were focused heavily on high volume low keyword difficulty and so i like tactics sort of like classic to build traffic to the website and building out keyword clusters but that traffic to the website wasn't driving business results and was actually causing a lot of work to maintain and keep it so we switched it to that bottom of the funnel approach which has, has given us like huge results in terms of the traffic value that we're bringing to the website and also actually increasing the traffic number as well as conversions overall in the end. So yeah, they're like probably the, through Google is probably the main parts that we capture demand. And then 
obviously we run that same sort of tactics in the space, like as you were saying, in building huge retargeting audience. So then we have retargeting campaigns running on as many different places as we can get in front of people. So on, on Meta, on LinkedIn, on Reddit and, 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 and other places as well. Yeah. Well, I must assume that you're using Cognizum itself to build out these audiences for LinkedIn matched audiences and Google customer match audience, Facebook. Yeah. As I, well, we really make use of Cognizum actually is like on Facebook. So we combine a Cognizum data. We build big audiences with Cognizum data to get that LinkedIn business level, B2B level targeting that then we upload into Facebook to get matched audiences. And where we have a high number of uh, mobile numbers, which is a real selling point for Cognizum, this actually helps us increase our trade on Facebook as well, where it matches on other data outside of uh, email addresses, whereas often people struggle to make match rates with B2B data because people obviously sign up to Facebook with their personal email addresses. And, and then there's other things that we can do as well that we, you know, in the Cognizant data set, you have technographics. So we can create lists where we're targeting and create matched audiences in LinkedIn, where we're targeting, you know, companies that use Salesforce or companies that use Outreach or Salesloft, which are key uh, other tech that Cognizant plugs into and would actually is a predictor of success so that then we can build audiences uh, that way. Yeah. Yeah. The tech stack targeting, I think is very, very powerful. Whether or not we have an opportunity to replace that technology, if it's a competitor or if you're an integrator, like you said, if you integrate with sales loft or Salesforce outreach. And then of course, there's also just taking those types of tools I'm thinking of built with as one example that focuses specifically on audience data, tech stack related, but then you can actually create a remarketing audience of, of all of the customers of your competitors. You can get a huge number of them and you, using that type of tech stack sniffer, you can put a matched audience in LinkedIn of all of Apollo customers. But the, what's interesting is that the people that are on Google saying Apollo versus X mm -hmm. or Apollo pricing, these are people that are still shopping, I think, and they're not Apollo customers. So you're not really taking the customers from Apollo, but you're intercepting what's likely going to be an Apollo customer, somebody that's just at the last stage of, I'm going to go with Apollo or Lucia. You, you crash the party. I, I love that expression. There's one of my favorite ones that we've done was um, Zoom Info, um, Chrome extension not working, which then we rank as the top page for. So the thing on the page, we give you different things to try out to get your Zoom Info Chrome extension working again before offering you an alternative solution huh. cool. to your, to your faulty <laughs> Chrome extension. That's great. So is your solution complicated and in the end it doesn't really work and then they say, oh, <laughs> screw this. So look, who, who are these guys? Cognizant. Let me check this out. Yeah. <laughs> And that's an SEO play. So you wrote an organic uh, blog post about that and it ranks. I actually interviewed someone for the blog last week, one of the founders of hellodata.ai, and they built a really interesting prompt for creating content that can rank really well for featured snippets. And they're in the real estate uh, property management software category. And they found truckloads of keywords that that had this combination of volume and low keyword difficulty. It's actually opposed to this, the strategy that, that you said that you used to do, but no longer are doing. But their specific focus is, is to try to get the featured snippet. And they have a prompt in ChatGPT that can produce that content, which is usually just the first paragraph. And they're crushing it. It's really interesting. Now, that kind of traffic is a little different because a lot of that featured snippet stuff is zero click, but you still get brand value because even if I go to a search result page and I read that featured snippet and it gives me the answer, I'm going to no notice who is that provider. This is kind of what I think the AI chatbots will do in the future is that they'll give citations. And I think they, that ethically they're really obligated to do this. But if they're going to take an answer right from your blog and solve somebody's problem with it, I think they do need to say that this was provided by Cognizant and whether or not they link or whether or not you even care about getting traffic to your website anymore, you want to see that your brand name is associated with solving someone's problem. And ultimately that's what it comes down to. And if I just remember Cognizant and I might first go on YouTube and find you there, or I might go to LinkedIn, I think it doesn't really matter anymore necessarily how much traffic you get to your website. It's really how much of your brand 
assets you can expose to people everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I think it will become a whole new battleground brands where everyone's trying to get the AI exploitation from them exactly in the same way that even now, like we happen to start to think about it because you can search, obviously, a chat GPT, you could go give me all the um, Europe's best B2B data providers and it will list out the providers. You could also be ask it, give me similar providers to Zoom Info, for example, and you'll get that as well. So we're already thinking about how in the future we'll be able to actually influence those search results, right? I want to not be on that list that it spits out. But I mean, it's kind of like the listicle game of today where if I just say set best sales outreach tools, the first page of Google after the ads is going to be all listicles. Top 10, top 20, top this, top that. Those websites won't rank organically for a, a search query that would include best or top or something like that. And if that game moves over to chat, it's going to be very interesting how they would even decide how to select who's the best. They might go to the authoritative source like G2 or Capterra and maybe say, well, according to G2, this is your upper right quadrant. And in your case, you're there. What we just showed earlier, but I don't know, G2's upper right quadrant, it contains these five players. I don't know how that's going to work. It's interesting to see how that's going to develop. For sure. Well, this has been great. We probably need to wrap up now, Liam, but this is a fascinating conversation. And it's great to hear you're really in one of the most competitive SaaS categories that there is, and you are crushing it. You've got a differentiated product. You've got a unique geographical strategy and, and, a, and a really great marketing strategy addressing demand generation, combining inbound with outbound, using your own software as well. So congrats on all the success. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go, was there anything that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked or something that you think could benefit our audience? No, I don't think so. I think, yeah, it's been a really great conversation. Thank you. Cool. So where can people find you online? Yeah, probably best places to find me on LinkedIn. Spend far too much time on there. Please feel free to message me and I will always do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. All right. So Liam Bartholomew on LinkedIn and Cognizant, just like it sounds. Well, thanks for the great conversation, Liam. And you have a great weekend ahead. Thanks, Paris. You too. Thanks for having me. Another great episode in the books. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get notified when future episodes drop, be sure to subscribe to Paris Talks Marketing on your favorite podcast player. And to learn more about our growth marketing agency, visit hop.online. That's hop, H-O-P dot online. Have a great day.